Everybody says the best storyteller wins, but what does that really mean? Well, in this skill, we're going to cover how to be a great storyteller. Now, my career in network marketing shifted from debt and desperation to peace and prosperity once I discovered how to become a great storyteller. Would it be okay if I turn the clock back to the 1993 era? I call it an era rather than a year. It seems like it was a 100 years ago when I was a single dad. I was raising two kids by myself, a 7-year-old daughter and a 17-year-old son. I had failed five times in networking in the 80s with really good companies. Joined again in 93 because I was in a business where the law changed dramatically and it affected a lot of us in our pocketbook. So here I was failing again while I was delivering shrimp. And I remember sitting up on the Tobin Bridge, big bridge that spans uh, from north of Boston into the city itself. And it was it was hot. This was actually in the spring of 94 now. And, boy, I was riddled with self-doubt. I'm sitting in traffic, knowing I wasn't going to make money in the seafood business. I'd been in for networking again here the, the sixth time for about six months. And I remember eating a sandwich, a turkey sandwich, and, uh, and a nice cold diet Coke. And it occurred to me that something really had to change. And it was shortly after that someone posed a question to me that for, would forever uh, change the destiny of our lives and led us to this skill, how to be a great storyteller. Before we go a little further and tell you about the incident that actually changed our destiny, it's really become clear to me in the last eight years, and it becomes more clear every year how significant it is to be a great storyteller. There can't be any debate in your mind that the best storyteller wins because it's the foundation of your career in networking, whether it has to do with prospecting, that is getting names or recruiting, bringing them through the cycle to bring them in your business. And equally significant, if not more significant, is teaching new reps exactly what to do and exactly what to say so they can be successful. Your ability to communicate is paramount. But let's start with the recruiting cycle and sort of focus on that. I'm going to leave it to you to understand that the principles I'm teaching about recruiting, why storytelling is so significant in recruiting, it's really the same when people are brand new. One of the things that really helped me was that I was taught and I really embraced it that when you bring in a new rep, you need to consider them the best prospects that you have. And I consider reps prospects until they're making a four-figure check and they've mastered storytelling because it's really simple. People hate sales pitches, but they love to hear stories, especially stories that are well told. So let's talk about this incident that really changed our career. And if you've seen our friends, Al and Nancy, you know we carry Al and Nancy through every single module. Nancy, of course, is an achiever, uh, cashing big checks, having a great time. And Al, well, he's not cashing any checks at all. Now, this story actually took place in Hartford, Connecticut area, actually in a, a Marriott in West Hartford. And I had been to see this guru, and I was in there for about 20 minutes when I knew he didn't know what he was talking about, because all he was talking about were goals and persistence. I certainly had those two things. What I didn't know that I didn't know uh, didn't really matter at that point. What I did know was this guy was not teaching anything that I could bring home and use and make a difference with people that I was talking to. So I came out in the hallway, bumped into a guy. He could see that I was distraught, and he sat me down, and he asked me a simple question. He said, imagine Al and Nancy, two distributors, and they signed up at the same time, so they're plugged into the same system. They paid the same price to enroll, same meetings, belief, comp plan, same grade hygiene. They're putting in the same amount of hours, the same commitment, the same upline, the same city. They were sponsored by the same person. Nancy's cashing huge checks. Al's not cashing any checks at all. 
what's the difference? What's the difference between Al and Nancy? And I said three words that changed our lives. Those three words were, I don't know. And he said, great, you're going to be able to make a lot of money if you can follow directions. He said, the difference is skills. Look it, if you were a plumber and you wanted to become a computer programmer, you would know before you made that career change that you'd have to learn some different skills to be as effective as a computer programmer as you were as a plumber. The bottom line is when people join network marketing, it never occurs to them that they need to learn some skills. And a highly significant skill in network marketing, since we talk to people, is learning how to talk to them. And learning how to talk to them effectively is best accomplished by learning the fundamentals of how to tell a great story. So let's get busy and learn a new skill. You know, there's a huge myth out there in our industry uh, that's just totally false, and that's about having posture. You know, you've got this great compensation plan and a great company, and you're in business for yourself, and everybody else has a job. So you, you need to pump yourself up with attitude. Attitude, no matter how you think about your business, no matter how great your product is, no matter how much you believe in the owners and the, and the founders and the compensation plan, it won't give you posture with prospects. So when we first start, we have very little posture because there's a little short list. And then maybe we get someone in and they have a list too. This is how you really increase your posture is the more people that you have looking at your opportunity, joining your business, and after they've joined your business, you've learned how to communicate with them so they push out huge lists then you have posture. Let me make it clearer. If you have 50 people looking at your opportunity that week between yourself and the people you're directly working with, and you have five or ten new people enrolling, when you talk to a new prospect, you have posture. It's authentic. They can sense it. And great storytellers get more people to look at their business. Therefore, they get more people to join their business. And because they know how to communicate when they get them in, they get more names out of them, and that gives them the opportunity to get more people in profit. Great storytellers have big posture. Posture is not attitude. It's directly proportional to the amount of people that you have that you can talk to effectively. Two things. Not only talk to them. Talk to them effectively so that they understand what you're saying and they're excited about moving forward. That's real posture. Let's take a look at this concept about why it's important to be a great storyteller. First of all, I think a great angle to look at that from is by looking at the biggest lie in network marketing. And as a byproduct of looking at that, it'll save you a lot of time and a lot of money from buying a lot of junk that's out there online about people promising to get you white-hot prospects. Anyway, (laughs) the biggest lie in network marketing is you just have to find the right people. Uh, This is totally false, and with a little common sense, we can quickly see that. Look at everybody you know wants more money. Everybody you know would love to pay less in taxes, and everybody you know would love more time with the people they care the most about. What are you offering? You're offering more money, lower taxes, and more time with the people they care about. So the big question is, why do they say no? Well, it really depends on one thing and one thing only. If the right people are everywhere, and they are because they all want those three things, it depends on what we say and what we do. If you know what to say and how to say it, knowing what to say and how to say it, that is to be a great storyteller, then the probability of them saying, yes, they're going to take a look at what you want, goes up dramatically. Now, if you're not sure that I'm correct about this, it doesn't have anything to do with the prospect. It has everything to do with what we say. Imagine yourself, really use your imagination here. This is worth the investment because it will verify and validate the great decision you made to invest some time in this module. It will help you get inspired to study this and to practice these little, simple, 
tips I'm going to give you to being a great storyteller. Because you don't have to be funny, and it doesn't have to be an incredible story. It just has to be a great storyteller. It doesn't have to be a great story, just a great storyteller. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But imagine yourself, use your imagination here. You're at a grocery store. Get a few bags of groceries in your cart, and you stand by your car. And imagine someone, a stranger with tan pants and a white shirt, and it's sort of a windy day, so he's got a windbreaker on, kind of can smell the uh, beautiful aroma of spring in the air, and, and he walks towards the car, and you tell him that you hurt your back, and could he please put the groceries in the trunk for you? And he says, sure. And he picks the groceries up puts the bags in the trunk and you say to him thank you very much here's a one hundred dollar bill and he might say what no 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 that's okay it's nothing don't worry about it he might say gee why don't you give it to charity he might say hey you got any other chores you want me to do the point is it would be a very pleasant experience now let's just rewind about 10 seconds you're with the cart with the grocery store uh, at the grocery store, and this same guy, tan pants, uh, blue windbreaker, white shirt, walks towards you. Wind's blowing a little bit, and you say to him the same thing. You hurt your back. He throws the groceries in the car, and you pull out a gun, stick it in his face, push him down on the trunk of the car, and say, "Give me all your money. I'm going to blow your brains out." What do you think his reaction would be? The point is, it's going to be completely different based on what you said. So, it really depends on what we say and what we do, and we can really light a fire under anybody's curiosity, have them leaning forward, ready to buy and ready to join in a matter of seconds, if we'll learn how to be a great storyteller. And this is what's really important, is by increasing the amount of people that look you increase dramatically the amount of people that are interested in getting to step three or the decision process. I like to call it three-step plan. Step one, we strike interest. Step two, they review information. Step three, we're collecting decisions. So if you can dramatically increase the ones at step one and you know how to tell a great story when you get back to them at step three, it's very easy for you to explain how our business works without really getting into any detail. It's incredible. So congratulations. Let's get busy with the skill. Communication isn't part of what we do. It's everything. By being a better communicator or a great storyteller, you're getting more people to look. Uh, Communication is the key in getting people to understand that what they do every day is something they get paid for, which is simply talking to other people. Communication is huge in becoming a great sponsor, so your team will take coaching from you, and it really is the key to the vault of the dreams of both yourself and people in your organization. Great storytellers are great communicators. I mentioned earlier there's a significant difference between a great story and a great storyteller. We've all been at a social event where someone's telling us a story and all we want to do is light our face on fire and put it out with an ice pick. I mean, it's absolute agony. On the other hand, there's also people that we know that have told the same story 5, 10, 15 times or more, and every time they tell it, it's funny or it's interesting or it's poignant. This is crucial, the difference between the two. So the stories that I'm going to share with you and the ones that you'll develop on your own, they don't need to be great stories. They don't have to save the world and save the whales uh, for somebody to be interested in your product. They don't have to be this unbelievable compensation plan for them to be excited about being able to make money. They just have to communicate with them. So being a great storyteller, it's about context. It's about identification, and it's about familiarity. You might want to jot those three words down. What do I mean by context? The story has to be in the context of what you're trying to relate to somebody. Identification, once they identify with you, they think they can do what you can do. And the more familiar you make it, the easier it is for them to move forward. 
This is key. If you understand how people make decisions and you tailor your stories that way, you're going to be able to communicate your interesting and great message about the opportunity, the product, or both, and you're going to be able to get yeses all day long because they're going to feel comfortable moving forward. Now, this is the most interesting part for me because this really sets up everything else. And it's really how people make decisions. And that's really what I discovered uh, shortly after meeting that nice guy at the Marriott in West Hartford. And he taught me that this was a skill-based business, and he led me to a couple of great teachers. And what I learned from them was how people make decisions. If you don't know how they make decisions, then all we do is start talking about the plan, the product, and the company, and their sales filter goes up. Everybody knows that the subconscious mind makes all the decisions. What a lot of people are unaware of is that the subconscious mind never forgets anything, never forgets anything at all. It might not be in your conscious mind, but there is nothing that ever slips out of the subconscious. And what happens when people are making decisions is the subconscious is looking for any like or similar experience And anything that feels good or familiar, it'll move forward. Anything that feels unfamiliar, it tends to shy away from. And anything that was an unpleasant experience, like maybe somebody tried selling once and they don't want to go out and sell. Uh, Anything that was unpleasant, the subconscious mind signals the conscious mind to say no. Now, they might not say no to you, but they might tell you they're busy. Uh, Can you call me next month? Uh, My daughter's getting married four years from now, and we have to plan the wedding, so call me in 2017, whatever. And how does this happen? What actually happens, and how is that applicable here that the subconscious doesn't forget anything? Well, when you were one year old, you got up, and you were trying to walk. Maybe you were 11 months, maybe you're 13 months old, and you're in the living room, you know, and there's a rug there, and you're drifting from one piece of furniture to another, and you've probably seen this yourself if you have kids. And, of course, the one-year-old falls down, and everybody laughs and gets up and falls down and tries to get up again and grabs a piece of furniture and climbs back up and tries to take another step, and everybody's rooting for them. And they laugh when you fall and get back up and laughter and falling and getting up. It's a normal thing. What you don't realize is this is a wonderful quality that we have. And that is we're willing to try things that we're not good at. We don't think about being embarrassed or criticized. We just want to walk or we just want to learn how to talk. Have your parents ever said to you, and do you have stories about your kids about words they mispronounced and you would laugh? (laughs) You talk about them now and you laugh about them now. But at that point in time, at that juncture, nobody felt criticized, nobody felt embarrassed because they couldn't do what the other people could do. But sometime between the fourth grade and the tenth grade, that gets beat out of us. You know, kids can be a little mean sometimes when they're, when they're together. They can be a little condescending and make fun of other people. And the subconscious remembers that. And sometime between those grades, our willingness to try things that we're unsure of, that we don't know how to do, kind of disappears. And even new things that you've tried in the past four or five years, isn't it true that you went and took a course or, you know, you had a guide or, you know, my wife wants to learn how to surf, so she's going to go to a guy that teaches people how to surf. Nobody wants to try that stuff on their own anymore. And that's really really sad, but if you don't recognize that, then you're going to miss the biggest reason why people don't join your business, and you're going to leave your business to luck. And that's not the case because you're here studying. See, nobody, nobody wants to be embarrassed or criticized. We don't remember what it was like when we were one or two and willing to try things. What we remember without, without fear of the consequences of our peers But what we do remember is what happened in those formative years from the third, fourth, fifth grade up through high school. Nobody wants to be embarrassed or criticized. And people tend to move forward with what they're familiar with. They tend to resist what they're unfamiliar with. Let me say that in another way. 
when people understand that it's going to be familiar to them, they tend to say, yeah, sure, okay. When it's totally foreign to them, they tend to not want to go forward until they have more information, which most of the time is an excuse in our business. So this is how people make decisions. They don't have any control over it. It's in their subconscious mind. It's telling them, don't do that, don't do that. You won't like it. It doesn't work. You don't like to sell. You don't want to be embarrassed. You don't understand what he's talking about. You don't understand what she's talking about. If you don't understand it, you're probably going to get criticized. You're probably going to have people make fun of you. Okay. On the other hand, if it's familiar, they move forward with confidence. Most people have been to weddings and we've seen people that don't dance. Maybe you were one of them. I know I was in my 20s. Uh, the reality is uh, people don't get up and dance because they're unfamiliar with dancing. You remember the previous uh, 10 minutes that we talked about how people make decisions. Most people won't want to learn how to dance in front of strangers. So they go to a wedding and... They don't dance, or they get up and maybe do a slow dance with their wife or their, with their husband. They kind of just shuffle their feet around a little bit. Anybody can just kind of stand there and do that. But the fun type of dancing where people are really having a great time, they don't participate in it. And on the way home, maybe they apologize to their wife or they say, you know, honey, I really wish, I know you love to dance. Would you show me a little bit at home? So next time we go to one of these things, I'll, I'll, I'll dance with you. And why would he do that? Because when he gets with his wife home or with, or vice versa, it's going to feel safe. It's going to feel comfortable. It's going to feel familiar. But that person is not going to get up and dance in front of strangers because they don't want to be criticized or embarrassed. Now, if you tell stories the right way, you create a familiar feeling. Like I said, we're going to focus a little bit on the recruiting side, some applications that come up in recruiting when you're trying to get people to understand how your business works and you're trying to get people to understand how they get paid. These are two places that people generally take a good prospect and turn them into a cold one virtually instantaneously because of the way they tell the story. So let's fix that right now. This is really a BFO alert, a brilliant flash of the obvious. At this point, I hope you understand I've spent the time that I've spent with you at this point to convey to you how people make decisions and why being able to tell the story is so crucial. I'm going to give you a couple of examples, but you will multiply your value to yourself, your family, and your team by a hundred. You become a hundred times more powerful once you understand how people make decisions and how to tell stories so that you can make the only sale that's really necessary to get people to enroll easily. What is that one sale that they do network marketing every day, but they just don't get paid for it? Once you convey that to people in a way that they can understand, they're in and you're white hot and rolling. So on this huge sale, you've given somebody some information. And when I say huge sale, you're selling people on the idea that they do network marketing every day. They just don't get paid for it. So you, let's say you've given them a CD or they, or it's after a meeting and you're at step three. That's the decision collecting. Remember step one is we strike interest. Step two, they review information. So we're at step three and it's time to help them make a decision. Al will blow it even though he has the same exact story. He just doesn't know how to tell it. He's going to say, well, you know how you go to the movies and you tell other people and then they tell other people and then some of those people go, well, the manager doesn't send you a check, but we do. It works just like the movies except we give you a check. And Al's second version, because Al's in a big hurry to talk about some nuances in the marketing plan or ingredients in the product, Al's going to say something like, oh, it's just like recommending a movie or a book. And that's why Al's story dies on the vine. What happens here is he raises the sales filter because they don't understand what he just told them. Now let's look at how Nancy tells the story. It's going to take a couple of minutes longer, 
But Al's going to be with his prospect all night long, drawing circles and explaining compensation plans and distancing himself from the prospect. Whereas Nancy, once she's done telling this story, she'll pull out an application and start writing. So let's look at Nancy's version. Nancy might say something like this. Well, most people have had this experience, Joanne. You know, they're driving to the, th- driving to the theater, and all the way to the theater they say, there's no way I'm paying four bucks for a Diet Coke in a paper cup. But they get inside the theater after they buy their ticket, and the smell of the popcorn, oh, it just seduces us right over to the counter. There's actually studies done that say even people that don't like popcorn are attracted to the smell. So we go over to the counter and, and we get our huge diet soda and our, and our value pricing. I always get a big kick out of value pricing. The value pricing is more than the ticket for crying out loud. But anyway, and maybe we grab a, a, some sugar too, maybe a Snickers bar or something like that. And then we get to these big, comfortable, cushy seats. And the visuals today, because of the digital recording, it's it's amazing. And the surround sound makes you feel like you're in the movie, not watching a movie. And you loved it. And that weekend, after the weekend was over, maybe you went over the weekend, uh, people at work asked you what you did last week. And they say, oh, I went to see Titanic. It was incredible. Salon Dion sings really high. Everybody drowns at the end. You'll love it. And maybe you tell five or six people. Now, let's face it. Some people never go to the movies. Some people go all the time and say, hey, we'll check it out. And some of them go occasionally, maybe once every two, three, four months. But they decide to go based on the fact that you told them that, Joanne. And, of course, they buy their ticket. They don't get in for free. The popcorn yanks them over, and they loved it. So they tell some of their friends about it, and and they run into you, and they say, Hey, Joanne, thanks a lot for telling me about Titanic. It was great. Remember the three words we talked about? One of them was context. One of them was identification. Uh, what's really important here is Nancy is going to finish because she understands context. She knows why she's telling this story. She's not telling to sell She's telling the story so Joanne will understand that she does network marketing every day. So she might continue by saying, so Joanne, do you ever go to the movies? And Joanne really has only two options there, yes or no. Um, so if she says no, say, well, have you ever recommended anything like a doctor book, you know, a shortcut when there was construction or anything like that. But let's just say Joanne said, yeah, I go to the, yeah, I've been to, I go once in a while. Say, great, have you ever recommended a movie to anybody? Well, sure, I have. Great. And have you ever recommended anything else, like a doctor or a mechanic or a a book or maybe a shortcut because there was some construction or a new Italian restaurant or a new Mexican restaurant in town? Well, yeah, Joanne says, sure. And has anybody ever thanked you for it? Anybody ever come up to you and said, hey, thanks for telling me about Titanic. It was great. Or thanks for telling me about Giuseppe's Italian restaurant. It was fantastic. Sure, Joanne says. And how did that feel? Feels great, doesn't it, Joanne? Yeah, it feels great. See, it's part of the human experience. We love telling people about things that we think they might like or enjoy or we liked or enjoyed. And most of all, we love telling people about things that we think that they might benefit from. It's really part of the human experience. Let me ask you this, Joanne. Do you have kids? Oh, yeah, i got a couple of kids. How old are they? Well, they're 12 and 14 now. Can you remember when they were 6, 7 years old and they'd come home from school and they'd tell you about a new Game Boy uh, game that they wanted or Xbox or a new pizza place that opened up or maybe one of them came home recently and said, hey, when can you bring me to Avatar or can I get some money for Avatar? Where did they get that information, do you think, Joanne? She's going to say, well, probably from their friends at school. Say, well, guess what, Joanne? That's network marketing. Your kids have been doing network marketing since they've been six years old. And guess what, Joanne? You did it when you were six years old, too. You did network marketing 
your whole life. You did it yesterday. You've probably already done it today, and you'll probably do it again tomorrow. Now, remember we were talking about, you told some people about the movie Titanic, and they went and they told a few people. Some went and some didn't. Well, the manager at the end of the month doesn't add up all the tickets and all the popcorn sales and send you a check. The company that I've just asked you to review the information on, that's exactly what we do. We pay you for something you've been doing your whole life anyway since you've been six years old. The significance and the difference of these stories is humongous. It's not the length of the story. It's not just the story itself told in a little bit different way. There's a trick to being a great storyteller. I'm going to go over a couple of them with you so you understand what I did. As a matter of fact, on the second slide that you saw where it said, you know, delivering shrimp, I actually told the story exactly the same way. Here's what Nancy did. When she told the story, she weaved in the five senses. Remember, she said the smell of the popcorn and there's no way I'm paying four bucks for a a Coke and a paper and a wax paper cup that that's touch. And we talked about the surround sound. Here's the thing. Okay. This is what's crucial is when they identify with you on a subconscious level. That is, they think they're like you. Guess what else they think they can do? They think that they can do what you can do. And in fact, they can because they've been doing network marketing their whole life. So not only does her story explain network marketing much better than Al's, but she's got the prospect to identify with her. So instead of being a cross from the table symbolically, she's now sitting side by side because Joanne has had the experience of saying, I'm not paying, you know, $12 for a value meal for popcorn and soda that cost 10 cents. She's had the popcorn drawer over and had <laughs> her resolution <laughs> broken down. She's been in surround sound and been at some movies where she feels like she's in it. The bottom line is whether you want to tell the story about a grocery store or movies or restaurants, and we'll give you several of these in, in upcoming modules, different ways to communicate the same message. The bottom line is what Nancy did was she leveraged the trust factor in the subconscious mind of the prospect by weaving the five senses into the story. So if you really want to make a lot of money, you'll go back and you'll listen to that story again and identify uh, where I talked about touch, sight, hearing, and smell. And fundamentally, you'll be able to do that too. You'll notice that it's, n don't make a big thing out of it. It's just sort of casual. Okay, and what happens is by being a great storyteller, she helped Joanne understand they recommend things every day. The other thing that she did that Al did not was she got Joanne to refeel the joy in recommending. And isn't it true that when you've recommended something and somebody compliments you or comments about it and said, hey, that mechanic you sent me to, what a great job, and he didn't rip me off. It feels great. What Nancy did in her story was she got Joanne to refeel what it feels like when somebody thanks her for recommending. Folks, that's familiar, and it feels good. And when things feel good and they're familiar, people tend to say yes. What we're really trying to share with you is how to talk in pictures because people think in pictures, and great storytellers make most people think not only they do network marketing every day, but they're just like you. That's what getting those five senses weaved in. And by the way, you don't have to get five senses into every story you try to tell. Three or four will do just fine, nice and easy, okay, nice and easy, weave them right in. But the main thing is if they think they're like you, then they're going to think that they can do what you can do. And that's critical. Al, on the other hand, he's going to deliver death blow after death blow after death blow to his prospects by using jargon. Is jargon familiar? I don't think so. It's unfamiliar. Things like upline, downline, crossline, clothesline, uh, you know, global business, 
bonuses, global business pools, matching bonuses, business volume, PV, GV, sponsor, uh, all that stuff is unfamiliar to people. And no, make no mistake about it, people join things because they want to be a part of something bigger. They're alone, and they want to join something bigger. Jargon makes it feel smaller. But it has an additional crippling effect. Actually, two. One of them is when you use jargon, their subconscious is saying, you've got to learn all that stuff. You don't have time to do that. You to tell them you don't have time. This isn't for you. The other thing is that jargon does is they don't understand the words. So that sets them up for potential embarrassment or criticism, and we've already covered that we know people don't want that. So after the meeting, the prospect says, well, how do you get paid? And Al says, well, first you sponsor three people. Eh, there's jargon. Then he says, once you've sponsored three and have a 1,000 in business volume, you become a yellow amethyst one. And then when they sponsor three people and you have 6,000 in business volume, you become a ruby red one and Al's all impressed with himself and he's drawing circles and beads of perspiration are flying off his forehead and when your um, yellow amethyst ones do what you did you become a white diamond one once you have three personal white diamond ones you become a, a yellow amethyst two and you get a partial share based on your business volume in the first six levels of the global business pool isn't that great? And what do you think the prospect's thinking? <laughs> it's pretty funny when you think about it. Now, while Al sits there for hours trying to explain what each pin level means and drawing more diagrams, and he's out of paper, and now he's drawn on napkins, Nancy's going to tell a little longer story uh, than Al did, but the person's going to understand they're going to pull out their checkbook or credit card, and they're going to join. So Nancy's version would go like this. Well, Joanne, how we get paid is pretty simple. Um, what grocery store do you use? Always get the name of their grocery store. And let's say, well, I go to Kroger's. Well, great. So let's imagine uh, that you and I are in a, a book club or, you know, we play poker once a month or something like that. Well, let's say a book club. And it's our turn to bring the Cokes, the chips, in the dip and I run into you at the at Kroger's and I say hey Joanne why don't we drive over together I just got a new car you're not going to believe uh, how the seats feel it's incredible it's got that nice new car smell so anyway uh, you go through the line Joanne and they ring in you we each had to bring two six packs of coke two chips and two dips each and your bill is $14, and you're standing there waiting for me because we're going to drive over together, and I do the same thing. She scans my uh, exactly the same items, but my bill's $18. And I say, wait a minute, how come mine's 18 and, and yours is 14 And you say, oh, I have this little um, customer card, sort of a customer loyalty card, and they give me a few bucks off every time I shop. Well, Joanne, how could I get one of those? Well, you just fill out the form. The girl will give you one right at the register. So I ask her for one, and she I fill it out. She re-rings my groceries, and I saved 4 bucks. And I say, gee, thanks, Joanne. You just saved me $4, like every time I'm going to shop, 3 4 5 bucks. That's great. How would you feel about saving your friend money every time they shop, Joanne? Pretty good, right? She's going to agree. Say, well, let's imagine... This is a customer loyalty program, but it's on steroids. Let's imagine that when you told me about the savings for getting that little customer loyalty card, that not only did I save 4 bucks, but 4 bucks showed up as a credit on your card. That would be incredible, wouldn't it? Well, yeah, that would be incredible. Well, and what if everybody I told, they save 4 bucks on their grocery bill, I save four bucks on everybody's bill, and you got a credit for four dollars on all of those people. That would be like a customer loyalty program on super steroids. Yeah, that would be incredible. Let me ask you this: Would you ever stop shopping at Kroger's, Joanne, if they did that? No, <laughs> she's gonna say no. I'd never stop shopping there. Well, as the old saying goes, I got some. 
good news and I got some bad news. Joanne, let me give you the bad news, okay? The bad news is Kroger's is never going to do that for you. The good news is that's exactly how this company works. We simply get customer loyalty bonuses every time somebody decides to purchase product that's good for them. Now, she understands how she gets paid. Al's person, well, they'll be there till 2 in the morning, and the guy will never go to a hotel meeting again. Now, why does this work so well? Well, the grocery store is familiar. Scanning and getting a rebate is familiar. And telling other people about it is familiar. And shopping over and over again at the same grocery store because they're getting customer loyalty points is familiar. All of those are familiar to Joanne. She put them in the experience. And I'm going to tell you right up front, except for one night in Seekonk, Massachusetts, in the last 10 years, I have never explained a marketing plan to anybody. This is how I explain it. Folks, people don't understand marketing plans. I mean, even companies change marketing plans because they thought they understood it, but they had to change it so they wouldn't go out of business. A lot of them have had to do that. This is what they understand. And when you really think about network marketing, not only do people do network marketing every day, but it really is a customer loyalty program. You're getting a discount. You're getting it at wholesale because you buy it. And when you tell other people about it, they're getting it at wholesale, and you're getting customer loyalty. When they reorder their monthly auto ship or transfer buy or whatever your company calls it, whatever they buy, whenever they buy, you get paid. Isn't that the same thing? as a customer loyalty program on steroids. Joanne understands this, and all all Nancy would say at this point, say, you know, after she says, I have some good news and bad news, let me give you the bad news first. Kroger's is never going to do it. The good news is we do that all the time. Uh, You just simply recommend this to other people, just like the movie story I told you, and every time somebody makes a purchase, you get paid. They don't need to know the details because... They believe that they do this. They can identify with Joanne. Telling stories, being a great storyteller, is so powerful because it turns you into a winning organization virtually overnight. Not just you, but your entire organization. Because most people think in pictures. Most people do what's familiar. Most people recommend things every day anyway they just don't know they're not getting paid for it and most people love the feeling of other people coming back to them and saying hey thanks a lot for telling me about avatar or thanks a lot for telling me about that new italian restaurant good storytellers make mlm familiar to most people what happens here is nancy by weaving the five senses and and telling stories in the correct way She puts them in the experience that's familiar to them. And since they can identify with Nancy and they're familiar with what she's telling them, it's very easy for them to move forward. Why not make it easy for people to join? Just imagine your communication skills dramatically improving. It's so simple once you understand how to be a great storyteller. Because everybody knows that the work really begins after we bring people into the business. So these stories, while we focused mostly on recruiting situations or exclusively on recruiting situations, you'll find all the stories I tell in these modules kind of weave a few of the senses in, and there's something that you're familiar with that I'm weaving the story around. Continue to do that with people on your team so they'll identify with you, They'll understand what you're trying to say, and it'll be very easy for you to get them to take your coaching. The mega tip to all of this, of course, is great storytellers make people think they already do what we do, and you know the rest. Once they believe that, they're ready to buy and they're ready to join. Let's review. I talked right at the top of the training about three words, context, identification, and familiarity. And if you would be so kind as to make a little triangle, uh, equilateral triangle, three equal sides, uh, 
Uh, on one, you want to write context. On another side, identification. And on the third side, obviously, familiarity. What do I mean by context? Use the stories to make a point, not ten points. Al will go on and on and on from one point to another. And, you know, you're going to get the basic Jerry Maguire line when they, when he says, does that make sense? <laughs> They're going to say, you lost me at hello. So really how to do this is to listen to what the prospect may be asking and think. If they're asking about how to get paid, that doesn't mean they want to know how the marketing plan works. If you're with an experienced network marketer and they want to know what type of compensation it is, sure, you might pull the compensation plan out. But what I do and what the champions of this business do is they listen to what the prospect is saying and they have a story, an arrow in their quiver that explains that one point in a way that the prospect can clearly understand in, in a language that they're familiar with. The second piece of your triangle there is identification, and we've already talked several times that if they can identify with you, and of course we've showed you how to do that on a subconscious level, then they're going to believe that they can do what you're doing. And you do that by weaving in the five senses. A word of caution. Um, you don't have to get obsessed with that to the point that you're weaving all five in, but with a little bit of practice, it's amazing how f easily you can get four or five of them in just very casually and naturally. It's really that simple. And just remember, we we talked about the popcorn, and the smell of the popcorn drags you right over to the counter. That's all I said about it. It's really that simple. They get it. It's it's happening on a subconscious level, which is where the decision's made anyway. Now, the third piece of your triangle is familiarity. You may recall we talked about Joanne and what store she went to was Kroger's. So don't use Kroger's if they shop at Shaw's or shop right or whatever find out what their grocery store is and put it in a language not only that they understand but use examples right in your own hometown or in their area that they're familiar with okay the names of things they know a specific movie etc if you'll weave the five senses in to get identification remember why you're telling the story before you tell it and you make it familiar they're ready to buy and they're ready to join Really, when you think about it, what would be easier for you? To continue to explain marketing plans and ingredients or to learn to be a great storyteller and have people ready to buy and ready to join in a matter of minutes? Peace be the journey. Keep growing.